some of the chat. I think that a lot of us are looking like we would uh, really like to do some Sphinx Moths. So I'm probably going to go and grab some, grab my tray of Sphinx Moths from my, uh, from my collection so that we can use those. But I did want to share with you a little bit of news about um, these fellas right here. Um, this is a carrion beetle. And I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat. <coughs> All right. So the link in the chat that I just dropped is a link to a research paper. It's 19 pages long. I have not read the whole thing yet. Um, I skimmed through it and got really excited because there's some interesting, um, there's some interesting news in it. It was just published about what in March of 2022 so about three months ago and it um, they published the uh, genetic works of coleoptera so they reworked some of the families and this carrion beetle and let's see this burying beetle, maybe I'll just bring it over here. All right, so this carrion beetle and these two burying beetles used to have their own family. They used to be in the family what we called sylph, Sylphidae, and that was their family all to themselves. Um, and we, I was always taught in school that there's just two different body forms. You have the carrion body form that's this kind of large, flat, and round body form. And then you've got the burying beetle form that's kind of narrow and cylindrical and sometimes has like orange or burnt, burnt orange shoulders. Um, Elytra. Um, all right, well... The Sylphidae don't exist anymore. That family is, is, is an old name. And the, now we call them Sylphidae. They're actually a subfamily instead of getting their own family. And they're a subfamily within Rove Beetles. And I just learned this a couple days ago. So, um, but it's been published work for about three months now that all carrying beetles and burying beetles are actually just another type of rove beetle. So their family now is Staphylinidae. That's rove beetles, right? Let me go look. Yeah. All right. So, um... They are all rove beetles now. So, I'm seeing some comments. Give me two seconds. It is like musical beetles. They like to move them all over the place. Well, at least you knew the difference between a cockroach and a click beetle. That's great. Yes, so the NAE makes it a subfamily and DAE makes it a family. So in insects, a lot of times you have um, IDAE is uh, the ending for any fam a Latin of a family name. Um, I-N-A-E is the ending for a subfamily. And then in insects, we also have tribes. Um, so those are underneath subfamilies and, and above genus. And those generally end in I-N-I. -I. Um, we haven't really gotten into the different tribes that animals are in. But if you see it, that's what you're looking at. Are carrying beetle carrion beetles the same as flesh eating beetles? I yes. I haven't heard that common name yet. Oh. I hadn't heard that common name yet, so I'm gonna look up that common name. No. Fleshing flesh eating beetles are dermestids, so 
those are a different type of beetle. Those are smaller. They have scales on their elytra um, that almost look like hairs. And um, dermestid beetles, or those flesh-eating beetles, are what museums use to uh, clean bones. So if they've got bones that come in dirty, they can put it in this, in this colony of beetles, and the beetles will clean the bones for them. Who invented the suffixes? I'm not sure exactly who invented the suffixes in insects or or why why they are the way that they are. I can give you um let's see, which one can I think of that's in a good example of this? Silpha? Yes. Mm. So when I when I think of a good example of 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 the taxonomic naming system, I will come back to that because a lot of times what what they do is that you've got a scientist who identifies an insect and then they put it into a genus. All right, but if there isn't an insect that's close enough to related to the one that you've got, you've got to put it in a new genus. Um, and depending on, and depending on if it fits into an old genus or a new genus, then the names kind of shift and change. But it's hard to describe without a good example. And that is not coming to me at this very moment. Papilio! Papilio is a good example. Um, Papilio are swallowtails. Um, all right, so uh, Papilio is a genus um, of butterfly. It, these are types of swallowtail butterflies. Not this carrion beetle that's under the microscope. We're going to switch stories really quick to uh, share a little bit about taxonomy first. So Papilio is a um, is a genus of swallowtail butterflies and when you're looking at it the first the original swallowtail the first I swallowtail ever identified was in the Papilio species and so you've got Papilio as the genus but then Papilio is actually in the subfamily let me make sure I have my my word spelled right yes all right so then um, your so your genus actually kind of builds up so if it's the first one in the genus ever made, then it's Papilio. But then if it's the first one in that subfamily, um, you create Papilionini, and then um, you get Papilionidae, um, which is the whole family, and that's all of the swallowtail butterflies. All right, so um, after that little uh, taxonomy, Funness. I actually I used to work in um, I used to work in um, an insect collection at Michigan State. I worked there for a couple of years, so I got a little bit of knowledge under my belt about taxonomy and the like. All right, so I'm thinking that we're going. I'm thinking that I'm going to go and grab some sphinx moths because that is what everyone sounded really excited about. I'm just going to leave these guys here for a minute while I go look for some Sphinx moths. They're my friends.
I've got them. All right, so I have a number of Sphinx Moths. Um, I very, very much love them. We can go over what a couple of them are, and then we can pick one to sketch, or we can talk about them as a whole. Um, they're going to have very, very similar wing shapes, uh, but they have very, very differing colors. So, aw, I love my Chrysina. Okay. We'll talk about those another day. All right, so um, we are looking at a variety of Sphinx moths. These are on my desk cam rather than on my microscope camera because right about now they are, they're too big for my microscope um, to be able to see them as a whole. And then we'll go ahead and pick one and then we'll put it under the microscope and sketch it all the way through. So, this one up at the very top, we call this one the white lined. We call it the white lined Sphinx Moth. You might guess is that, you, you may guess that the uh, it's named after this white line right here, and you'd be correct. And actually, it is this Sphinx Moth that has its proboscis curled in a way that I was able to take a really cool picture of their mouth parts. Oh man, I don't know if I've shown this to you yet. All right, so this is the zoomed in picture of right about here on that Sphinx Moth's head. This is the proboscis. This is that long straw-like mouth part that the Sphinx Moth is going to use to uh, drink nectar from flowers. So I, uh, I think that that is a pretty cool specimen to be able to show me that. <clears throat> All right. I do have a handful of species I'm not sure about. I'm not really sure which which species this guy is. My next one right here, this one is what we call the six spotted sphinx moth. All right, named for the six orange spots on its the laterals of its abdomen. So one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the little, there's a little itty bitty six one, but it's a little harder to see from the top. All right, and I really love this Sphinx moth that's kind of this darker gray, very wood, um, very, very wood camo. Um, I'm sure was not easy to see. This was collected, ooh, this was collected actually in Arizona. I am, I haven't identified this one to species. So there's four of them in this tray, and then we've got another tray of Sphinx moths. Of course we do. Um, so this one right here is another white line Sphinx moth. And then we have, I like this one because it has kind of these racing stripes. I'm not sure the, a number of these species, but we can look at them. I can share them with you. Ants, get out of the way. Uh, go down there. Sammy, don't mess with the ants. Okay. That works, right? So these sphinx moths, these handful of sphinx moths, actually have eye spots on their hind wings. So when they open up, uh, you've got those two pretty big eyes that are looking back at you. Um, and then this sphinx moth is huge. This, um, this sphinx moth, I believe they call it the poplar sphinx moth. Let me look it up really quick. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. So this is the poplar sphinx moth, and the poplar sphinx moth is a large sphinx. It's probably the biggest sphinx that I've collected. Look at me, I put my ruler away. I was cleaning up. All right. The poplar sphinx moth is easily 13 centimeters, um, has a 13 centimeter wingspan. 
So that is fairly large. Susan, you've got these ones, the small-eyed Sphinx Moth? All right. I wasn't sure which ones those ones were. Um, and it's possible that it's also a genus name. All right, let's see. Ecuador and Galapagos? Oh, man, Marley, I am a little bit jealous. You're probably seeing some awesome insects. So you've got this other, this is a six-spotted sphinx moth. And then, last but not least, this little fella here is also a sphinx moth. It's what we call a snowberry clear wing moth. And um, you can see that it actually does have clear wings. If I was to put something underneath the specimen, you can see my finger through it. And that's just locations in its wing where it doesn't have any scales. Um, a lot of times people will also call, if they see them, excuse me, um, a lot of times if they see them, they'll also call them hummingbird moths because they look very much like a hummingbird when they fly. Thank you, Eric. They're my sphinx moths. Now, I do have one very unfortunate sphinx moth, but it comes with a story. Would you like to hear it? You're going to hear it. It's going to happen. I have this sphinx moth. This sphinx moth is dry and sad and, and the wind was never spread. And I think that as entomologists, every now and again, this happens. I will be able to, hopefully, hopefully I will be able to, um, to bring it back to life a little bit to give it some moisture, rehydrate it, and then spread it. That's the goal. But... There's also a reason why it ended up this way. So I was driving, I was uh, on a road trip, as, as I do, and I was collecting at night, right? So I had stopped, and I was, well, I was driving on the expressway, and I looked over, and I saw all of these bright lights, and they're all pointing down at a, um, at like a series of car dealerships. And you may or may not know this, but the lights at car dealerships bring in lots of bugs. Like, lots of bugs. And then the insects will come and land on the cars, and they'll, like, land in the things and all over the place. And so, um, I had remembered that in the past, I had walked through this area and collected a good number of things. So I got all excited, and I got off the expressway and drove back backwards so that I could go and grab the, um, that car dealership area, especially because it was getting kind of dark, and, um, I wanted to get out and see what type of bugs were around. I saw some cool flying things. So, I'm walking down the sidewalk, and just doing my thing, and every now and again I look over and there's a cool bug on a car, so obviously I go over and I collect the bug and I put it in my vial and I keep walking, um... <laughs> and I have my bug net with me, and I had gone all the way down to the corner, and I was coming back, and I see this sphinx moth, and I get very excited, and I didn't have my envelopes, I didn't have my moth envelopes on me, so that was my bad. Um, so I have a sphinx moth in one hand and a vial with bugs in my pocket, and I'm heading back towards my car. Um... And I'm heading back towards my car, and um, I'm, like, in my car, and I'm shuffling through things trying to get to my butterfly envelopes, because as it turns out, they were a little bit buried. And I look up, and there's cop lights, like, flashing, woo-woo lights, and they're uh, coming after me, like, all right, miss, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm collecting bugs. I'm an entomologist. I explained to him the whole story, and he was like, well... I, and I was like, I've been mostly staying on the sidewalk here. And he was like, well, did you cross over into that area over there? And I said, well, yeah, once or twice. I was collecting insects. I uh, didn't really touch anything else. And as it turns out, between the last time I had collected there and that time, the uh, dealership had installed um, motion security um, and even though there wasn't a fence there, uh, I guess there was, like, a little three-inch stalk thing along the outside that was, that was detecting the motion, and so, uh, they 
called the cops on me, and this poor s silk silk moth that I'm holding in one hand, it never gets properly put away because he asks me to uh, he asks me to drive on. So I get in my car and drive away, and it has been in this container ever since. So he's been in here for about a year now. Poor guy. He got he he uh he'll we'll we'll finally get him get him pinned up and straightened. But that that's my bug story. All right. I get stopped by police officers at least once every time I go out collecting. Like go out on a larger collecting trip. Oh, Susan wants to know why the snowberry clear wing gets to keep its wings in a normal position when all of the other moths have their wings spread so beautifully. Well, the snowberry clear wing was collected by me in, in 2008. So this was even, this was before I graduated high school. I pinned this specimen up and I didn't really know how to spread butterflies back then. So that's one of the older specimens. And a lot of my older specimens are going to, are are not spread properly. Um, but I like to leave them the way that they are because that's part of the memory, right? <laughs> Eric, I have collected at banks before. <laughs> you know the drive through banks where you have like the ATM machines right there and the lights are all super lit up? This good, they're good collecting places. We would like to know what the species name is on this sphinx moth right here um, that is to the left of the poplar sphinx. And I am not exactly sure, but what I can do, hopefully that didn't hurt, hurt anything. What I can do is find Oh, I know it's right here somewhere. I have this really awesome Sphinx key that I would have pulled out ahead of time if I knew we were going to be talking about Sphingids. <clears throat> Give me two seconds to flip through some books. I have all of these really old insect keys and old pictures um, that MSU every now and again would go through their books and throw things away. Oh man. Sorry guys, no Sphinx Moth key. north of Mexico. Sphingoidea. So we should be able to identify that sphinx moth for you. This is fun, right? Let's do this. Oh, right. Which one are we going to focus on? Ooh. I like the white line sphinx moth. I like this specimen because we also have the ability to see its mouth parts and we'll be able to zoom in on those. Either the white line sphinx moth or the hummingbird moth because both of them are smaller and easier to fit under the microscope. So are we good with the white line? I'm happy with it. I'm getting so many specimens around. Okay. Woohoo! Yay! All right, so 
this is going to be our white line sphinx moth. And um, we might be able to go back after we get our sketch done and see if we can identify some of the other sphinx moths that I don't know. Um, all sphinx moths are in the family spingity. Notice the D-A-E at the end for family. Um... And the white line sphinx moth sometimes I have them memorized. This one I don't. Is Hylis lineata. So I'll go ahead and give you that. Alright, so my sphinx moths. They Every single sphinx moth on the planet, it has a hind wing that is half the length of the forewing. All right, that's going to be your defining characteristic. That's what I was always taught to look for in moths. And if it does have that, you likely have a sphinx moth. So if we're looking all the way across, it's ooh, the wingspan on this moth is. Uh, nine centimeters. So that's a pretty, pretty decent, um, that's a pretty decent moth. Sphinx moths are ones that I really love. They fly, um, they fly generally between midnight and two in the morning, so they're night owls like me. Uh, so I get that about them. Now, uh, sphinx moths have long proboscis so that they have the ability to drink from flowers at night. Um, there was even a probos there was even a sphinx moth called the Darwin sphinx moth, and it was found in where um, Marley is Madagascar. It was found in Madagascar, and um, Darwin said there's got to be some insect that's n that's pollinating at nighttime that I can't see because there's this flower and it has a really long thin tube and I haven't seen any insect pollinating it but something's got to be interacting with it so we so he postulated that it was a moth flying around at nighttime um, later it was found and actually named after him the Darwin sphinx moth and I think it has a proboscis that's like a like 12 inches long something something crazy all right so that gives you the overall shape of our sphinx moth and um the scientific name i'm gonna go ahead and start my sketch too i've been chatting you guys up for 30 minutes You know, I would believe that the white line sphinx moth was out there in the northeast in, um, I would believe so. Let me go ahead and check distribution for you really quick. Yes. Uh, white line sphinx moths are found in every state in the U.S., um, the only one it hasn't been pictured in on Bug Guide is in Maine. So they might not like it so cold all the way up there, but they are across the United States. So you'd be able to find these guys pretty much anywhere. Um, and... Yeah. Alrighty. Bloop, bloop, bloop. So the white... Lined Sphinx. All right, and Hylis lineata. <gasps> Broke my pencil. All 
Alrighty. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and start our overall sketch, and then we'll be able to kind of look over the microscope and view them all close up. So, right here under the microscope, we are seeing that we've got this nice head, this kind of extension of the head, the long proboscis that it actually has tucked outside of its head. That's not natural. Normally, it's tucked right between their palps that are kind of fluffy right here. Um, so, it died kind of with its tongue out. But that makes a really cool opportunity for us to see it and to, you know, to check it out. Um, you can see that here we've got the antenna. Um, moths are known for having big feathery antenna, but sphinx moths don't have super feathery antenna, but they are very thick. They, um, so we'll be able to see that. They almost remind me of, they're almost like rope-like rather than um, being a, a butterfly that's thin and delicate right? Um, our body is pretty hairy and pretty thick coming around. We've got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, um, something like seven abdominal segments that I can count right off the bat, and then a front wing and a hind wing that's half of the size. So something that you guys got me doing was sketching very lightly ahead of time just the overall body shape so that I can make sure it's all going to fit on the page. But what I might do is turn my picture sideways because I want to be able to sketch both of the wings. I don't want to be limited by the paper. So I'm going ahead and giving myself the head and then kind of this wider thorax. Nice and fluffy. And then its abdomen comes down and narrows pretty quick. And so that's what we're going to get for our body. And then I'm going to sketch our wings really fast. So our shape is going to be long and thin. So up here, they kind of come up to an angle and they narrow, come down this. They come up to almost a point and then they curl over. And then they angle in, and you could almost, you could almost create this triangle. You see how the point of the ant of the uh, front wing almost creates this line all the way to the tip of the abdomen. You fit almost is like this triangle. Um, so we can take that point and kind of point it at the abdomen, and give yourself that light sketch because that's also going to be where the hind wing reaches out to. So we've got this wing coming back in and narrows back in. And then our hind wing comes out, comes out to this line right here and comes back in. And then we can go ahead and erase what we have left of this. And that's a lot of times what I'm going to do to measure my front and my hind wings. And then you can see that the front wing is double the size of the hind wing. And then I'm going to do it the same on the other side. Pull it back at the angle of the body, bring it in. Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and put the specimen back on the microscope and we're going to check it out. Hi friend, rotate. My sphinx moth is doing a little bit of dancing on the pin. It's spinning. There we go. So you're seeing this dark spot here. This is one compound eye. The other compound eye is on the other side, but the um, the moth's head is just tilted a little bit, so you can only see the one side. Um, so we're looking at right about here on the top of the head, and my moth has a little bit of a more straight and narrow head, so I'm going to go ahead and add that. Give it its thick compound eyes on the edges, and then narrow it in. 
and then go one more time for where the mouth part connects. All right, and so I'm gonna go ahead and give us some darker spaces so that we can see kind of where the striping is. It's got two stripes the, down its head, one to the left and one to the right. Welcome, Eric. I saw you in the chat. All right. Um, we've got this really awesome spiral happening right here on the side of its head. Um, and that is the proboscis. If you want to see that image one more time, I think I still have it on my screen. I thought I did. Oh, I added it. It was on my other screen, wasn't it? Darn it. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and add our curly Q right here. And it's nice and um, it's very, very even. And this is gonna be our this is gonna be our proboscis. Um, that is spelled proboscis. And funny enough, the an elephant's trunk is also called a proboscis. Oh, that that was funny. All right, so moving back from the head, I'm gonna go ahead and see if we can shift this microscope at all. We can go ahead and check out some of these. Oh, that's so pretty. Check out some of the uh, some of the texture on its back and some of its colorations. You can see these are the antenna, so they're nice and thick, very very like thick and robust antenna. They're not thin and and dainty like a butterfly, but they are, also aren't huge and feathery like some moths will have. Um, like for instance, uh, silk moths have huge fluffy antenna. And maybe we'll do a rosy maple moth at some point. Would the tongue ever be out like that when it was alive? The tongue would never be out curled up next to its face like that if it was alive. Um, they do uncurl their mouth part. They uncurl it and unwrap it to drink nectar. But then generally when they're alive, they actually are going to roll up their mouth part and they're going to tuck it in between. I'll show you. We'll flip this moth over so that you can see where the mouth part belongs. All right, so just like how, um, just like how true bugs have a piercing and sucking mouth part that has a sheath around it, um, the proboscis also kind of has this a place where it sits and it's right here You can see that it has this kind of hairy fluffy cushion on the right side and on the left side And that's where it's generally supposed to curl up into right about here. Those are like the little butterfly cheeks essentially. I think that they're I'm Not sure what part of the mouth it would be adapted from my guess would be labial palps but I wouldn't be 100% on that. Um, so they're right here and they're fluffy and that's where my proboscis belongs. And naturally that's where it would have gone and that's where it, where it would have curled down into. So from the top you wouldn't be able to see it. So if you're drawing a realistic or a living butterfly then you can go ahead and, um, and skip the proboscis on the side of its face. So all insects have the same basic mouth parts. They have, but, but then, um, <laughs> Susan, that's a good question. So all insects have the base mouth parts, right? They have um, an upper lip, a labrum, a bottom lip, a labium, the labial palps, um, the mandibles, you know, they, they have these pieces, but then they're adapted and changed. So if they have labial palps, I'm not 
sure if we would call them that, but they do have an appendage up in there somewhere <laughs> that has been adapted and changed to make what they have now. Um, let me look. So they are going to have labial palps. They're, they would either... They, they would either be those fluffy regions right there next to the proboscis, or they would be underneath there. Pick a moth, any moth. Okay. All right, so on our thorax, it looks like we almost have these uh, these two very similar patterns on the left and on the right. Um, these are uh, these are patches of hair on my thorax that generally are going to stay straight down even when the moth is flying, so they don't it doesn't really get affected by the wings as much. That's pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start sketching this in. So we've got two sections right here. So I'm just going to break my um, thorax into two. And then there's white outer lines. So let me go ahead and give my outline. And then I'm going to go ahead and try and sketch in some of these darker areas and leave our colors in. Something like that. I recently got a set of very good coloring pencils, colored pencils for my birthday, so I'm going to start practicing with them. And once I get good enough, I'll be able to start coloring with you guys. All right, so that is the end of my uh, end of my thorax and where we're going to start the and where we're going to start the abdomen. I'm going to go ahead and switch this word back to its species name. Alright, if you're doing some type of color palette in your nature journal, I do want to let you know that there are, okay, a little bit of light did help. The stripes in the abdomen are white, but there is some kind of the same pink color in there, in this stripe here and here, that you'll see in the hind wing. So, um, each one of these segments, it looks like, now that it's under the microscope, I'll be able to count the number of segments. One, two... Three, four, five, six. Is that a long segment at the end? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six. All right, so there are six abdominal segments on my moth here, and each one of them has some kind of lineage, delineation between this one and the next one. So you can see that there's these kind of stripes. Let me get this refocused for you guys. There we go. Beautiful. All <coughs> Avea asks, um, so are most of moth coloration made of pigment, pigment and will they fade eventually? Yes. Yep. Most moths have pigmented colors in their abdomen, and Ave is asking this because we've had this conversation before, the differences between um, pigmented and structural colors. Um, most moths, yes, are going to have pigmented colors. I even have a Luna moth that has gone completely clear, all right? Um, but there are moths that have structural colors. Um, there's a moth called the sunset moth, and it's a diurnal moth, meaning that it flies in the daytime, and 
Um, a lot of people mistaken it for a butterfly. It's very bright, very beautiful, very metallic. I'm not sure if I've shown you one on this live stream yet. Um, but those have structural colors, so they're never going to fade. But most, um, most sphinx moths, or most moths are going to have colors that have the ability to fade. And that's why they suggest when you have specimens and collections like this that you want to make sure that they stay in the dark most of the time or they don't get um, direct sunlight. Because if they do, um, the direct sunlight's going to fade your specimens faster. Um, you also can make sure that the glass that you put over them is protective or archival glass so that um, the specimens inside don't get, you know, corrupted by the light. Good question, Susan. If it's clear, doesn't it mean the scales had fallen off and not that it had just lost their colors? Yes. But... I didn't do anything to make my to make my Luna moth um, lose its scales, so I haven't zoomed in on its wings yet to see if its scales are still there. I will admit that. Um, it would be interesting to see if they were still there. I'm willing to pull some drawers out. We'll have to look at it later. Ooh, do the moths begin to fade while they are still alive, and do their bodies replace pigment? I am not sure if moths are going to replace the pigment in their wings. Hmm. Those are both great questions. Um, moths do get, like, tattered over time. They're going to lose their scales, but... I don't think that moths live long enough to have their wings fade. Like the big, um, like the big silk moths, they only live three to five days. They don't even have mouth parts. So five days isn't long enough for them to lose the coloration in their wings. Um, I can't think of a moth that lives long enough that also would fade in its colors. Where is the white relative to the edges of the abdominal segments? So, um, the white is at the end of the abdominal segment. Sorry, I kind of went through and just kind of colored mine in. But um, if you're looking at the abdominal segments, I guess I didn't give my guy enough. I needed another one right about here. So the, the, the white stripe is at the edge of the abdominal segment. So it goes dark, and then one line of white hairs, and then that's the end of the segment, and then the next one, and then some white hairs in the end of the segment. And then along the edges, there's also pink um, in some of the edges. Uh, I just don't have colors that I'm using at this very moment. I will shortly have color. There you go. So Susan Light would like to share that the morning clopes, even after they overwinter and look tattered, they're, at least their yellows are still very bright, vibrant. So I haven't seen moths really fade, fade heavily until they're, you know, 20 or 30 years old um, and older, you know. But I have had, I have seen, I was databasing all of the eastern swallowtails um, 
in the museum collection at MSU. And there was a specimen that was from the late 1800s. It was like 1890. And I got all excited because me as like a, as like a science nerd and a bug geek thinking that I was like, I was holding a specimen that was collected, you know, back in the 1800s. That's just so cool. And so I took a picture of it. But it did have, it did still have some yellow tint in its scales. So it had faded pretty good. But um, it still had some some tint, so that doesn't all fade all at once. Um, you do lose greens a lot faster than you lose like the browns and the yellows. The pink also goes away pretty quick. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start in on these wings. Now, a lot of times I like to talk about wing venation. Um, Especially in wings that, yeah, so let's look at wing venation really quick. Um, in the butterflies, they're going to have some type of cell that all of the veins radiate off of. And so if we're looking for that cell that the veins are radiating off of, it's going to be right about here. So this is the base of the wing, and it comes out, and you can see that it kind of splits like this. There's this Y in the wing. And then it comes all the way out here. It comes to about here and then back. So you've got this cell right here. And then you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sammy, I gotta go get my cat. Sammy, no. Sammy. Arr. Okay, we're back. Sometimes you have to stop for a, a cat fight. Alrighty, so um, there we've got this cell in the wings, and then all of the veins are going to come off of, a lot of the veins are gonna kinda radiate off of this. So I wanted to show you that before we started sketching. Marley, so your favorite colors are pink and green? That's good to know. All right. At the very tip of this, uh, um, of the, like, the base of the wing right here, there is a little edge, there is a little scoop that comes back up this way a little bit. It makes it look like a speeding moth to me, like a little... Probably is aerodynamic. All right, so um, we've got this little bloop on the edge of the wing, and then I'm gonna go ahead and give us these veins. Now we've got this D cell that's like this, and it's this triangle in here. That that's what we are looking at right about here. Actually, we want it to go longer okay so we've got this cell in here and that's what we are looking at right about here and I do want to make sure that we give it a little bit of a distance from the edge and so we're gonna go off of this one two three and then one, two, three, yeah. And that's gonna be our wing venation for our Sphinx moth. But then you can also make sure that you give in, that you color in these colorations. So you've got the, um, this white line that's coming all the way across. And then these little white lines that come this way, those are actually highlights of the veins. So if you already know right here where the veins are, you can go ahead and make all of these veins white or white faded, um, just like these are, all right? And the stripe comes all the way. 
You guys are gonna have me drawing butterflies and moths yet, huh? It's a uh, practice for me too. So I'll probably come back and add the colors to this one. We definitely have to look at a rosy maple moth if your favorite is pink. Yeah, Jen, um, I, I was thinking that when I was thinking about green. Those poor Luna moths in the collection, in the MSU collection, they were pretty much all white. They were just so pale. All right, so our hind wing, I'm going to go ahead and just give us a microscopic image and then pull our specimen back over to the, to the desk cam. Our hind wing has our, our edge that comes out kind of to this angle that we've got going on, and it angles back in towards the body. And then up. And then we've got a pink, pink stripe. So I'm going to go ahead and give it this dark band, and then I'll go in and add the color later. If you're also adding this white, she does have white around the border of her wing. That's a little harder to see here on my desk cam, but you can see it over there on the microscope. Yes, the green color in a Luna moth is a pigment and not structural. So the green in a Luna moth... Um, it fades very quickly. Um, and you can kind of tell the difference in the green in a Luna moth versus the green in, let's say, a Chrysina or a, a Jewel Scarab, because Jewel Scarabs are green and structural. These guys. These guys are green and structural. Um, whereas Luna moths are green and pigmented. These guys are kind of metallic, and Luna moths have that very flat, dull color. That's, some, that's how you can kind of tell, is you've got the, um, <coughs> you have um, the, the green that is pigmented is going to be a dull or a flat color, whereas a green that is structural is going to be metallic. And the reason is because the color can change and shift a little bit depending on the angle that you look at it. It's kind of the, the base of structural colors. Alrighty, so I got one side of my wing sketched. And I know a lot of times you ladies and gentlemen are sketching a little bit faster than me, so I'll, I will, I would leave one side undone. I know I haven't added my antenna yet, so I do want to go back in and add those. The antenna go in this white stripe that's next to the compound eye, and my antenna, I'm going to make them very dark, and they're going to come out back this way. And they do thicken just a little bit at the end. Alrighty, so my question to you ladies and gentlemen is, I think we've got our Sphinx Moth sketched. We could talk about, um, we could talk about how all Sphinx Moth caterpillars, uh, have, um, a horn on their caterpillar. So if you've ever seen, like, uh, people call them tomato hornworms, uh, they are more commonly called tobacco, or they're more correctly called a lot of times tobacco hornworms, um, but 
both species exist. I have found mostly tobacco hornworms on my tomato plants. But all sphinx moths have those little horns on the end of the um, abdomen of the caterpillar. So that's one way to tell them apart from everyone else. And I know someone said they like to talk about insect butts. And so the important part of a sphinx insect butt is um, the horn on the end of the caterpillar's abdomen. <laughs> Yeah, so there we go. I got the one half done. <laughs> um, but you know, they look exactly. They're bilaterally symmetrical. So I don't really want to have to worry about sketching them both ways. I can go ahead and put this guy back. Um, I did want to show you, ladies and gentlemen, this is really awesome. This really awesome book, it has 1971 on it, and we've been looking at sphinx moths, so I figured I would share this with you. There are beautiful colored plates in this book. Alrighty. <laughs> So there are absolutely gorgeous plates in this book, and they are all colored. And I thought that there was a chance that I could find your species for you. This is Manduca oculata. It's not Sexta. So this one's very closely related to the six-spotted sphinx moth that we saw earlier. Oh, here's some of the those like very black and white, um, like these moths that are in their almost their gray tones. Let's see. Right. This one. I had a, um, I had a, uh, I had a colleague, his name was, uh, Gary Parsons, and he ran the, he runs the, um, museum over at MSU, and he used to say that sometimes identifying insects was like figuring out a riddle. You had to collect all of these clues from all different places, um, so it's, you can't just collect one insect and look at one book and say, that's what it is, because it's likely that... It's possible that the thing that you're looking at doesn't have the species that you have. Let's see. Or that there's more information. Oh, these are some of those eye-spotted sphinx moths. So there are many, many species of these eye-spotted sphinx moths. And that's going to be one of the reasons likely reasons why I haven't identified that one all the way to species yet. Here's our big poplar. Here's our big poplar sphinx moth down here. It comes in two color forms. So both of these down here are the same species, but you can see that this one's kind of darker and this one's lighter. Thank you. I uh, I wanted to share it with you, ladies and gentlemen. We've got hummingbird moths. It's um a lot of the scientific names. A lot of the scientific names in this book. Um, ooh, I've collected this one before. A lot of the scientific names in this book are likely have likely changed since 1970, but the pictures are still good. Now, one of you were out there were talking about how when they close their wings, they make that weird shape, and that's a lot of times when you've got these sphinx moths, like this one right here, or this one, where they've got these very, very narrow front wings. Sometimes when they close their wings, their hind wings give this really crazy design. Oh, hey! That might be our guy. 
Hey, this was collected in Madera Canyon. That's possible. Xylophanes Falco. All right, so if we look at this species right here, I think this is at least close to what I have. When we were looking at this fella right here, um, this one was collected in the American Southwest. I thought it was collected in Arizona. As it turns out, it was collected in Texas. But it looks very, very similar to this guy. It even has that same, those same racing stripes on its abdomen. So I would say that that is the closest that we're going to get for sight IDing. Yeah, so that's, um, those are Sphinx Moths. I'm glad we got to chat about them. And now you guys are all up to date on the new, um, now you're all up to date on the new, uh, phylogeny of, of carrion beetles and burying beetles. You know that they are, um, they have a whole brand new family. You know, they don't have a family all to themselves anymore. Um, good, good, good. Let's see. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, go and give this video a thumbs up. Let other people find it if you're having a good time. We love it. Um, thank you so much, Marley. Um, let's see that. Those are silk moths. Um, I have these fellas right here that are sitting next to me that I'd love to talk about, but I know that that would probably go a little bit later. I have the energy to sit around and chat with you guys. So, um, do any of you want to hear about a genus that is very close to my heart? The Chrysina species, that's these guys right here. Um, if not, we can do them um, next week. So what do you think? Do you want to talk about Chrysina? They're... Oh, actually, you see this? My background right here is is where I can collect these Chrysina up here in the top left corner. Oh, good. Thank you, Ivea. I'm actually running a couple of moth nights soon um, here in the Philadelphia region, so that's going to be fun, too. Oh, look at that. I have some yeses for uh, Let's Talking About Chrysina, so let's do it. These are Chrysina. There are only four species of Chrysina in North America. All right, this is all four of them. I was so excited to last summer have finally collected this, these two right here. These are Lacantiae's Chrysina, um, Lacantiae's Jewel Scarab. And uh, <laughs> it was the last species that I had to collect before I had all four. Um, I want to talk about them because I love them. Now, this first one in the top left corner, we call it Chrysina wood eye. It is this metallic green coloration, except that my Chrysina wood eye is way more and way better than just metallic green. Um, but to show you, I've got to throw it under the microscope really quick. So, we're going to come back over here. Gotta catch them all. It is so similar to Pokemon. Seriously. Check it out! Chrysina Wood Eye has blue, metallic blue tarsi. Like, blue, blue tarsi. So we've talked about um, leg parts, right? This is the femur, this is the tibia, and then coming off of the tibia, you've got these segments right here, and they're beautiful and metallic blue in wood eye. And, um, yep, they're my favorite because of it. Also, the only place you can find Chrysina wood eye is in a certain mountain range in western Texas. And that's the only place that you can find them. So out of the four species, they're actually, Chrysina wood eye is actually the most rare. Um, 
I've collected a couple of them. I love them. I like climbing around in the mountains with them, too. All right, so that's Christina Wood Eye. Now, the next one, this one in the bottom left corner, does not have metallic blue feet, but it has metallic purple legs. Chrysina, would I? Exactly. Would I, would I love to talk about Chrysina, would I? Yes, I would. That could be a tongue twister all by itself. Now, this species is Chrysina bayeri. It's found in Arizona and New Mexico. And it is still a structural color, so it's still this metallic, shiny green when it flies in. But it has metallic purple feet. And not just tarsi, but their entire legs, from the femur to the tibia and all the way to the end of the tarsi, they are metallic purple. I did not dip this one's feet in nail polish. It polished its own feet naturally in the wild. This is how they come. Look at how shiny. And they have very, very strong tarsal claws. So let's show you that. There's some a good example. So they have very, very sharp tarsal claws and if you let them crawl on your shirt or crawl on your hands you can feel them kind of digging into your hand as they're holding on with these like talons um and they're kind of hard to get off your clothing if they get if they land on you all right so that's Chrysina bayeri we have two more species the next one uh, we're going to talk about is Lacantii. Maybe it's only it's only one eye. Give me a second. I think. All right, so Chrysina Lacantii is this one right here, and I will admit Chrysina Lacantii is kind of the least colorful of the four. It's also why I wasn't horribly upset that it was the last one that I collected, but because insects are very much like Pokemon, and you got to have them all. Right? I um, was really excited to have collected this final one. And um, it's interesting and metallic color is actually on the underside. So right now we're looking at the ventral, the bottom of this beetle. And you can see here and here. Now these beetles, they don't have a bright color like metallic blue or metallic purple, but they are this very shiny copper color bronze color um and so that is their unique are there two claws per foot yes there are two tarsal claws for every foot um and in chrysina they have the ability to open and close their tarsal claws too they have muscles that make them do this so sometimes you'll see their claws kind of stuck together like this and sometimes you'll see them wide open like this one, if we, um, if we zoom down to right about here, his tarsal claws are pretty open. Maybe? Oh, I, do I have to go up? I do have to go up. Come on. Yeah, so you can see that his tarsal claws are kind of open. There's one here and one here, and they're a little wider, separated. Yes, they can do live long and prosper. Of course they can. All right, so this is Chrysina lacantii. Now, this species I collected for the first time in a location called Wing Mountain. And Wing Mountain is in Arizona. It's 
Um, probably 12, between 1,200 and 1,400 in latitude-wise would be my guess. Um, and I was up there on Wing Mountain, and it was dark. And when I say dark, like, it, the sun had gone down, but the moon hadn't come up yet. So there was no light source other than my, my fire pit. Um, and when I walked away from my fire pit... I could only, I, I didn't have the ability to see my hand in front of my face. That's how dark it was. Um, but, um, it was only like that for about 30 minutes, and then everything got brighter when the moon came up and everything kind of, the forest seems a little more friendly when there's, uh, when there's light. <laughs> All right, and we've got the last one. And we're going to say last, but definitely not least. This is Chrysina Gloriosa, the glorious jewel scarab. All right. This beetle is gorgeous, and when it flies into the light, everybody gets excited. All right. Um, they are metallic green, and they have metallic silver stripes on them. And these stripes are very, very bright. Um, they are pretty much exactly silver. And they have these really beautiful metallic green legs. Just overall, a beautiful beetle, a glorious beetle. This is his antenna right here, coming down. So that's our glorious jewel scarab. And all of these beetles come to black lights at night, so if you are ever out collecting, um, they can fly to your lights at night, especially when it, it when you are in the American Southwest and you're in up of and you're in up one up in the mountains, right? So Arizona, a lot of people think it's all desert, but when you get out there, you realize that Arizona has deserted regions, but there's also a lot of mountainous regions when you go further south. And those regions uh, you can drive into, and you've got canyons that you can blacklight at, and you can bring in some absolutely gorgeous beetles. The eyes! Yes, exactly. Can we focus on them sometimes? Like do a whole episode about Chrysina next week? Is that what you'd like, Marley? Look at those. Yes, the eyes. Yeah, so the Chrysina Gloriosa is looking at you. I have had so much fun chatting with you guys today and talking about beetles and moths and more beetles and more moths. <laughs> I am definitely willing to throw these jewel scarabs into the mix um, for sure. And I also have a couple of insects up here that were suggested. Someone suggested the 10 line June scarab the 10 line June beetle. I do have one of those that has its antenna all open. This one right here, you can see that it has those really awesome antenna and they are open. So we'll have to look at this one some week. Someone suggested those. Is my URL always the same? Unfortunately not. So the link to my so the link to my live stream isn't always the same, but you can um, the link to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash insectopia is always the same. So if you were going to go and share uh, and share information about the live stream and tell people about it, I would definitely just go ahead and share my YouTube um, my uh, youtube.com slash insectopia um, 
because each of the links stays with the video. So next week when I do, <laughs> um, next week when we do a different beetle, maybe the 10 line June scarab, it'll stay that, that link stays the 10 line June scarab for the whole time. Or like this link right now is always going to bring you to the Sphinx Moth video. All right, so for you out there that want to share it with fellow black lighters and you want to show off some Sphinx moths that you can find around the region, every Sphinx moth that I showed you today was collected in the United States. All right, so um, they, are, they are out there and flying around. Yeah. So subscribing and then hitting the little bell notification lets you know that. Oh, I just finished editing a new whiteboard video. Um, so I'm going to be posting a video about the Joro spider shortly, probably in the next couple of days. So I do not have caterpillars in the collection that I have right now. Um, but caterpillars, when collected properly, do not just shrivel. Um, if they shrivel, then you can't identify them anymore. Um, you can use, there's two different ways that you can collect, um, there's two different ways that you can collect caterpillars and keep them in your collection. There are a couple of different ways that have been used over time, but there are two ways that are readily used nowadays. All right, the first is using a chemical called CAD. It's K-A-A-D. And I honestly, I don't know what the mixture of chemicals is that goes into CAD. Um, but it's a chemical that when you put a caterpillar into it, the caterpillar, um, the caterpillar passes, but also um, it pulls, I think, the, the, body fat out of the caterpillar quick enough that it doesn't shrivel and it kind of keeps it plump and then after 24 hours in CAD you move it over into alcohol and then you can keep the caterpillars in an alcohol vial and they'll never shrivel up and they're good to and they're good to show forever. Um, their colors do fade sometimes but when you're identifying caterpillars a lot of times you're identifying caterpillars using their hairs. Um, there is this crazy book that's actually no longer in print and it's green so it's gonna show up on my green screen but it's called Immature Insects and there are keys to caterpillars there are keys to caterpillars in this book that include their hair designs so I don't know if you know this but how we actually identify caterpillars is we look, every single hair on a caterpillar's body is labeled and numbered. Some entomologists had a little bit of extra time on their hands. And so when I'm looking at um, when I'm looking at identifying caterpillars, these are the types of graphics that I'm looking at. Let's see, I'll flip it to the right side. So these are kind of the graphics that I'm looking at. Each one of these rectangles is one um, is one segment on the abdomen and it'll tell you which segment. So this one says A1 at the bottom and then they'll have names and numbers like L meaning lateral, SD meaning subdorsal, D meaning dorsal, and I think we also have, yep, over here on this one we've got some we've got some ventral hairs but this is how you identify caterpillars is just with their hair di um, hair diagrams and then with some pro leg characteristics and sometimes this is the head capsule or what a he caterpillar's head looks like when it's flattened out as a sketch <laughs> yes Yep, entomologists had no sleep because they were busy labeling caterpillar hairs. Mm-hmm. Yep. And people like to say, all right, I love this book, right? Um, this book is wonderful. And if you're into identifying caterpillars and really learning, 
and really learning immatures. This it's the only book that's um, that covers everything. It's a two volume series and it's out of print. Um, so they're a little bit more difficult to get your hands on, and I think they're a little bit ex they're they're pretty expensive nowadays. But they're pretty amazing. Now there is a couplet in this book, and I can't. There it is. Aha, my. Uh, here it is. Now, a lot of times when you have, uh, we call them, we call them couplets a lot of times because there's two choices, right? Um, you follow this number or that number. You have an A or a B or a one or a one prime, right? But in the Lepidoptera key, in the Butterflies and Moths key, in the Caterpillars book, there is couplet 108. And it was, it was joked about in our class because it's like, oh no, you got to couplet 108. This couplet has six characteristics here and six characteristics here. And the way that you decide if it's you follow this way or this way is you have to go through every single one of the six and say yes or no. And then you go in the direction that you have more than three of. <laughs> so it gets a little complicated. I, I'm laughing about that. Yes, the, the flannel moth caterpillar, right? Or the fact that it has so many hairs. When you look at the base of the hairs of the flannel moth caterpillar, um, you'll notice that the hairs come out in tufts. So when there's an insect that has very tufty type hairs, um, the, the images in the book will show will show instead of one stem, kind of multiple stems from one piece, showing that instead of it having a single hair out of the hair, out of the follicle, there's a kind of a tuft of hairs. And that's how they did that. So they do consider the whole tuft kind of one single thing to report. Um, yeah, but Fred Stare went ahead and edited these books. They're two volumes. Um, Fred Steer also worked at the MSU Museum while I was there, so I was lucky enough to get mine signed. Yay! Thank you, Fred Steer. Oh, man. Alrighty. I think that's it. We've gone on enough rants today, I think. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go over to our closing page. Right, right, there it is. All righty. Um, so thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging out with me today. As always, I super love chatting with you, and I love teaching you, and I love talking with you about bugs, and I love being stumped by you, and I feel like it happens regularly. I'm still, there was one question up here that I haven't, that I know I didn't answer, and I'm definitely going to scroll back and figure out if I can, if I can get it. Oh, the question was, do the, do the insect's bodies replace the pigment if it fades? And that's a really interesting question, and so I'm not exactly sure. I didn't take insect physiology. Um, that was one class that I really wanted to take in college, and um, I had taken all of the other graduate level classes as an undergraduate. Um, you needed to have the professor's... Um, you need to have the professors okay to join a graduate level program, graduate level class. But um, they all knew me and they were like, yeah, you can join us. And so that was fun. But the physio teacher said that it was going to be too difficult. So he wouldn't let me in. So now I have an insect physiology book um, that I haven't read yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Mm, yay! All right, so thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging out with me. I super, super appreciate it. I love chatting with you. I do teach a variety of classes for students. If you know a young person in your life, um, 
I teach on OutSchool right there. Now, I don't think that I've mentioned this in a previous, um, in a pre in any of the previous live streams, but the link in the in the description box not only takes you to my classes, but includes um, my little. Uh, my little coupon code. So if your student is new to OutSchool and follows the link below, they're going to receive $20 towards any OutSchool class they want, whether it's mine, my class, or any other OutSchool classes. So if you know a, if you know a young person who has never taken an OutSchool class or has never gone on OutSchool, you can use my link and sign up and get $20 and see what it's all about. Um, right there, that's your reminder to go subscribe to my channel. If you subscribe, then you'll get notifications about when I post new videos and when I'm going live. Uh, if you hit the notification bell, that's even better because your phone is going to ring whenever I go live and it's going to say, hey, Trisha is sketching. You should come and join her. <laughs> um, this a QR code right about here is how you donate to Insectopia and how you keep me floating. All right. This is um, this is one very this is one piece of what I do I uh, I have my hands in lots of different buckets but this is something that I do and I love and if you love hanging out with me I super appreciate getting your support um, so thank you for the people who have already tipped I super super appreciate it you changed my life and um, for all of the people who will tip in the future. All right. I will admit recently this thing right here, I haven't been doing as many guests that bugs. I've been so busy teaching classes that I haven't had a chance to really take a lot of micro microscope photos. Um, I'm hoping to get back into that shortly, but I have my whiteboard video coming out soon on the spider. So that's pretty exciting. Um, feel free to reach out to me on my website at theinsectopia.com. There's a little contact page. If you want to share your sketches with me, I love seeing all the sketches that are made during classes. Uh, you can, uh, on the contact me page, it has the ability to add a file so you can add, you can upload your image and share it with me that way if you'd like. Um, I think that is all of the little checkpoints. So, um, thank you ladies and gentlemen for supporting me, for being here with me. If you haven't already, go ahead and thumbs up this video so that other people find it and get to know the love of bugs that obviously we know. And, um, if you know someone in your life that, uh, you think would love to chat bugs with me, go ahead and suggest it to them because we always like having more people around to chat and ask questions and have ideas to bounce off of. So thank you for joining me this week and I will see you either next week on Thursday or even sooner on Sunday. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your week. <laughs> have a wonderful rest of your week and stay buggy.